Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. But De Bruyne, my goodness, Jeff, you know, the, the world is going mad, isn't it? You look at the amount of money they're paying for this boy, it's just absolutely well. bonkers. There's players you see and you think, yeah, but I just don't see this. I don't see 50 odd million pounds for this player. I really do not see it at all. And what he does, like all top midfielders, he affects the game in terms of obviously assists, goals. He's, he's the best in the world at, at him in terms of, you know, that position of uh, offensive midfield player. Can you even explain how he thinks? Because I struggle at times because it's very difficult to understand engineers. Me, me too. <laughs> To understand the evolution of Kevin De Bruyne is to understand the evolution of the modern day attacking midfielder. Many midfielders who were the centerpiece of their teams when the number 10 was at the peak of its relevance struggled as the elite teams' need for a mercurial playmaker declined. But every time the game evolved and demanded something different from the number 10, Kevin De Bruyne answered the call. In this video, we'll look at his tactical versatility to explore the many faces of Kevin De Bruyne. And when assessing De Bruyne's utility, we won't chart his evolution season by season, but instead we'll switch lens from position to position to capture the breadth of his evolution. De Bruyne made his senior team debut in the 2009-2010 season, meaning that he arrived at the tail end of the dominance of the 4-4-2 across many European leagues. And this was the formation of his primary coach at Genk. This formation, of course, meant that there was no natural home for a number 10 behind a striker. But a wiry 17-year-old De Bruyne was already showing not only his adaptability, but the fact that he would go on to be a genuine difference maker. De Bruyne slotted in on the left-hand side of the 4-4-2. And this was where most of his appearance came, as he showed that even on his weak side, he had the ability to hit the byline and take on his fallback, especially in cases where his left-back was less willing to overlap, as was more common back then. This meant that De Bruyne was more often tasked with providing the width for the team. But still, when the opportunity presented itself, De Bruyne pounced at the chance to drift centrally and allow his natural playmaking instincts to flourish, as he had already started to produce staggering assist numbers. In three of his four seasons with Genk, he was absolutely vital to the side. But the 2010-11 season was a high water mark, with a 19-year-old De Bruyne being vital. As before De Bruyne, Genk had only ever won the league twice, with the last time being almost a decade prior. But that season, De Bruyne scored 5 and racked up 11 assists to lead Genk to the championship for just the third time in their history. This form would draw the attention of Europe's top sides. But at the same time, the landscape of many midfields was shifting, as slowly the 4-4-2, a staple for many sides, was truly fading away and being overtaken by another formation that allowed artists like De Bruyne to once again be the key cog in the machine. His stints in the Bundesliga across Wolfsburg and Werder Bremen were where we most often saw De Bruyne as a traditional 10. And here he began to truly set himself apart. If Phase 1 was going from being a promising starlet, seeking game time away from Chelsea, Phase 2 was becoming truly one of the best young players in the world. And Phase 3? Threatening to become one of the best players in the world, regardless of age. And both of these he achieved in Germany. As with Werder Bremen, he won the Young Player of the Year award, and his teammate and future Werder Bremen captain would declare that De Bruyne was the major reason they had avoided relegation. From the 10 position, both with Werder Bremen and Wolfsburg, De Bruyne roamed the pitch, making the most of his positional freedom, with his coaches trusting him to know where the spaces were where he could make the difference. On the transition in particular, he had the ability to pick the ball up at speed, and slide in wingers ahead of him. But his major role was that of chance creator at Wolfsburg. And in fact, at times he stayed so high up with his strike partner that he looked like a second forward. Primarily though, he was the one tasked with picking apart defenses and to try riskier passes. And as a result, he had one of the lowest pass completions in the side. But that was because this risk was often worth the reward. And at this time, he was honing his skills that would elevate him to the next level such as a whipped cross, both low and high, 
that always seemed to keep itself between the keeper and defender, effectively becoming impossible to defend. At Wolfsburg, Karl's hero, Bastost, was often the beneficiary, with De Bruyne to Bastost being the most fruitful partnership in the 14-15 season in the Bundesliga. And if winning the Young Player of the Year award with a struggling Werder Bremen was shocking, he upped the ante, as in a league that featured the likes of Robin, Ribery, Royce, Neuer and Lewandowski, all operating in and around their prime, a young De Bruyne shone above all others, with 30 goal contributions in 34 matches, with this maestro role seeing him being named as the player of the season, setting a then-league record for assists in a season and being a part of two of the three major trophies that Wolfsburg have won since 1997. De Bruyne from attacking midfield showed that he can make the difference in saving struggling sides from relegation as well as elevating teams to the next level with silverware and this secured his move to Manchester City. And in his early City days and brief Chelsea spell, De Bruyne was faced with a problem that many attacking midfielders of the time were facing, just before the 4-2-3-1's dominance began to fade. What happens when your team plays with a number 10, but you are not the established playmaker for the side? While at Chelsea, during De Bruyne's time, there was a clear first-choice number 10 in Oscar. While with the Sky Blues, David Silva was already at club legend status and would be difficult to display centrally under Pellegrini. In both cases, De Bruyne reprised his wide role, with 89% of his Chelsea appearances coming wide, primarily on the right-hand side, and 69% of his 15-16 minutes with Manchester City coming wide, as he showed he could do it from either side. But where at Genk, he had tended to stick wider when he did start wide, now De Bruyne's creative flair was too good to keep on the flanks, and he was again entrusted with knowing when to drift in centrally. But he could still create from wide when needed, and the skills he had honed in Germany came in useful, like the searching crosses from wide that allowed him to hit the byline and look to cross at times, or even cross from much deeper regions. The accuracy was such that despite often having only the diminutive Aguero to aim for, the ball, like a heat-seeking missile, would find its way to the Argentinian one way or another. But De Bruyne's spells as the wide creator coincided with the peak of the marauding fullbacks, who would look to move up and down the pitch, hugging the touchline and joining attacks as quickly as they could, so that the fullbacks were often tasked with providing all of the width and this freed up wide creators in the ilk of De Bruyne to drift infield. So often, rather than hugging the touchline, he found himself moving inside the pitch early as more of a 10, forming a good relationship with David Silva, where they would look to create and maintain possession with similar ease. In many ways, this position was a microcosm of his versatility. The ability to hold the width when needed and still create with arrowing crosses and good combination play with his fullbacks, as well as knowing when to drift in centrally to be the architect and when to create with more intricate passes. But the best was yet to come, as now rather than merely looking to adapt, De Bruyne alongside Pep Guardiola helped to pioneer a new type of role. De Bruyne had survived the first trial that many attacking midfielders of the time had faced by showing adaptability in playing across the three in a 4-2-3-1. However, the demands of midfielders would shift once more, as the 4-3-3 that had been dominant in Spain for years became the first choice on English soil, spearheaded by Guardiola. This, of course, meant that suddenly there was no dedicated number 10, as we saw in the 4-2-3-1. This could have seen De Bruyne slip into home comforts and drift out wide as he had done previously. But Guardiola favored traditional wingers who had the pace to take on their man and the discipline to stay out wide rather than drift in centrally as De Bruyne would have. So Pep saw the opportunity to use De Bruyne in a much more reserved role, now having him as a central midfielder in a three, the role that would see the Belgian develop into a world-class player and soon a generational one. It was a role that was facilitated by the adaptation of the fullbacks, as the evolution of fullbacks and attacking midfielders had become inextricably linked. At Manchester City, from Pep's very first season, 
the inverted fallback came to the fore, and as they moved in alongside Fernandinho, David Silva and Kevin De Bruyne would be unleashed, pushing higher up the pitch, in a role that De Bruyne coined as the free eight. Ironically, this free eight position was one of the first times that De Bruyne was forced to take up a much more disciplined role rather than instinctively drifting to wherever he felt. But this position had all the benefits of having De Bruyne as your chief creator, as he would often be found in zone 14 in close proximity to the center forward, where he could slip in his striker, as now he had the elite movement of Sergio Aguero and eventually Haaland to pick out, with the pairs enjoying fruitful relationships with De Bruyne directly assisting Aguero 23 times and Haaland already on 13. But the Belgian's adaptation brought new conversations to the forefront. He and David Silva's roles, combined with Pep's front five structure, meant that now the half space had increasingly become a talking point. The front five tended to outnumber many back fours, especially when the winger hugged the touchline, meaning that opposition fullbacks were often dragged wide. And De Bruyne, time and again, made a now trademarked run between the fullback and centre back unchallenged. That low cross that had looked so threatening at Wolfsburg had become a finely sharpened tool, and with the cold hearted precision of a viper, he would whip across along the ground, giving his teammates the easiest of finishes. But he could also play a more withdrawn role, potentially drawing three men as a midfielder, fullback, and centre back were never quite sure who should be picking him up in this position allowing De Bruyne to slip in wingers who could then do the crossing from the half space instead or if the wingers were picked up, De Bruyne's crosses from the half space to the back post could cause just as much danger to defences. There were rarely stepovers or fancy footworks, but the precision, simplicity and effectiveness could make him nigh on impossible to defend and as a result, De Bruyne racked up the assists and was now truly world-class and rapidly moving into the generational and soon all-time great conversations. But the free aid role also brought a new side to him. We had seen him play creator to an elite level, but now he at times stepped into the role of conductor when it was needed. You see, even as a free eight, it was impossible to just spend all of his time roaming between the lines as he did when he was at 10, especially when the ball was deep initially. So now he instead had to drop deep to assist in the build-up play, combining in earnest with his pivot, helping to dictate the tempo of the game, speeding it up and slowing it down as required. He showed the composure in these highly contested central regions to not buckle under pressure, but also kept his decisive streak, being the one in midfield who was willing to take the risk to bypass his man or attempt a riskier pass. He even showed the intelligence to know where the spaces were on the pitch and when to break free from his more disciplined role often dropping into this pseudo right-back position to have the room to get his head up and cross even from deep. This free aid position, where he was forced at least initially to begin deeper, saw him have his highest attempted passes per 90 in league competition, as the play truly began to go through him even in deeper zones. However, De Bruyne still had more in his toolkit. If Pep was dipping his toe into having De Bruyne as his conductor, Roberto Martinez went all in with the Belgium national team. Martinez decided that the back three would be key to unlocking Belgium's golden generation in a 3-4-2-1. Belgium were blessed with attacking prowess, but with Lukaku having nailed down the centre-forward role, it meant that there were two slots left for De Bruyne, Hazard, Carrasco and Dries Mertens. Hazard and De Bruyne had to be automatic starters, but Martinez felt that he had to sneak in an extra attacker, and there was a way to do this. Instead of having De Bruyne play here, which would have been his natural position, often Martinez started him in a midfield two alongside Witzel or Fellaini, meaning that De Bruyne now genuinely had to operate as one of two pivots. And even in this role, he showed discipline and restraint, as rather than being at his swashbuckling best, he looked to dictate tempo from deep, as often his partner deferred to him, meaning that De Bruyne had to know when to play it safe and look for his wide men or just maintain possession, when to find one of the dangerous floaters between the lines and when to look for something more expansive. De Bruyne had showed almost every way that a number 10 could adapt, not only to remain a starter as the game's evolution got rid of the 10 role, but also to reach new levels and become the centerpiece no matter how the midfield evolved. 
but there was one more arrow in his quiver. This was a role designed to take advantage of De Bruyne's elite movement and spatial awareness, as well as his great ball striking, and was an emergency measure as Aguero's availability slowly began to decline as he made his way out of the club. It came in two primary forms. Initially, as a genuine solo false nine in a 4-3-3, who'd look to drop deep and cause midfield overloads whenever it was possible. Though physicality may not be the first word associated with KDB, the Belgian has more than enough pace where when gaps were made in the backline, he could burst into them to look to finish. The second iteration of this was when Pep shifted the side to a 4-4-2. But of course, with Pep, it was not a traditional 4-4-2 and instead employed a double false nine in the shape of Bernardo Silva and De Bruyne. With Bernardo Silva alongside him, the flexibility was taken to the next level, as the pair were interchangeable, with one or both dropping deep at any moment, while Bernardo was often happy to act as a beacon to draw defenders to create room for De Bruyne. In the absence of a traditional forward, De Bruyne elevated his potency in front of goal and in the 21-22 season, he scored a career-high 15 goals in the league as he dragged the citizens to yet another league title. Kevin De Bruyne over the last decade has proven to be the barometer for modern attacking midfielders. He has delivered on paper with ridiculous assist numbers as well as having a menacing goal threat, while still being able to deliver in big game moments. He has shown flair and a taste for the spectacular, especially from range. But most of all, his constant adaptation has shown why the game could never evolve past him and why he became a truly iconic player. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll love this one on screen now where we take a tactical look at Messi's most iconic match linked in the top right as well as on screen and in the description. And the visuals for this match were provided by Play by Metrica Sport, whose software helps you to make these analysis. The best part is that if you click the link below, you'll get 10% off of your subscription.